So uh, I know everybody's just getting out of lunch, and usually it's about time. So I uh, hope you guys don't fall asleep on me. So I just want to start with a, a video. Hopefully the sound works. for zombies. So actually, I stayed here at the Meridian last night, and uh, this was on my desk when I came in. <laughs> the zombies, and I uh, thought it was a little bit weird, because that's kind of what I'm talking about. Today, and Chris is here with me, my tech co-founder. So thanks for coming, Chris, uh, right here in the front. And that's Doug, Doug Pierce. So it's always so cool to start something new. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, it's like the cool thing. I think there's like Silicon Valley TV shows about startups, and they always talk about the, the fun parts of, you know, getting into an accelerator, um, you know, making friends, building a team, but they never really, like, just like today, they never really talk about those hard, hard, hard times where uh, you don't know what's gonna happen the next day or the next month or after you graduate your accelerator, you run out of money. Um, you know, I said at the beginning, everybody wants to cover you on Tech in Asia or Startup HK or, or uh, you know, TechCrunch. But um, what happens when all that fun stuff is over? So uh, this is the very first page of the current this startup, Weibo Agent. And I made this really quick by myself, uh, like July 2012. Really ugly, no, no back end. It just collected email address and Weibo account. And that's what I always recommend. I, don't, I think this was a success. I just spent about 20 minutes to make this and I started marketing this out to people that want to get insights about Chinese social media to uh, improve their businesses. So I had people signing up and I went through a lean startup machine in Shanghai, which then talk, took me to China Accelerator, which was where I almost died in the bungee jump. But uh, um, actually somebody died on that bungee jump about a month later. So luckily that wasn't me. And uh, not, then they opened it up after a week. They just closed it for a week and then they <laughs> reopened it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's that's near death experience. So you know, a lot. Of, I was like considering going to China Accelerator, and uh, I know some people here have been through accelerators, and there's kind of more and more accelerators popping up all around the world. And I get people contacting me all the time: Should I join the accelerator, or should I do it by myself? Should I give up some equity for a little bit of money and uh, a program? And I, I remember when I was thinking about going, people were telling me because I, I know a lot of people, so. I, get, I lose focus because so many people give me feedback. I, I do the opposite of what a lot of people do. I get too much feedback. But uh, I decided to go. Our team decided to go to China Accelerator, and I don't regret it. I think it, I always recommend people to do an accelerator. Um, and I say so, uh, the biggest benefit of it is to build your team. So I've heard some people asking how I find uh, my co-founders. Uh, whether you already have a team or you didn't finish building your team, if you can get into an accelerator, I think that's where you really test that relationship and you really um, learn 
if that if you work well with these people in a in a in a environment. Because a lot of times people are doing startups part time at the beginning, and they're trying to build their team. They're going to events like this. They're trading name cards, and they're trying to find uh, technical or marketing co-founders, but they're never really doing it full time. They have their day job and they're paying their rent. But I think going to an accelerator, if you can, is, is good, whether it's in the east or the west of the world. Um, and uh, actually during accelerators where I met, met Chris through an introduction. So I was having a lot of turnover in my team. And uh, I was looking for more technical people to help me. And I was losing people and getting people and like taking overnight trains to Beijing where I met my, my wife from actually. So I met her in Beijing during my startup time, uh, which was pretty, another team member. And user feedback, so this is a picture, I guess the slides are dark, but um, that's me here and like Gabri and Amy. So we would do focus groups all the time. And I know some people said earlier, like focus groups are not the same as real customers, but you know, when you just have a landing page with no back end, you kind of, your best bet is probably have a focus group and try to get those people in the room that are, um, as fit your profile. So I kind of had a mixed, I had a mixed room of people. Uh, it was in Dali in China, which is up kind of near Beijing. And I would put an ad out in English websites, like, uh, I don't know which one was, was in Dali, and then I got some email newsletters. So I got eight, 10 people. I'd buy them dinner, usually is good enough, or I'd give them some kind of training seminar. So it usually be like half of the, seven to 10 p.m. Like seven to eight would be, uh, Introduction to Chinese social media, and then next would be your focus group, which is watching people, signing them up on our beta, and then watching them use the product, and listening to them. But the overwhelming thing is there's like different feedback by every single person, and I don't know, I guess that's not a good thing, right? You wanna get, you wanna try to find one common problem. But one thing I did learn is they didn't want uh, analytics. They didn't want to just know like what Chinese people wanted. They didn't know, they didn't really care what people had to say, they just wanted customers. That's why I learned, especially to sell to small businesses. Small businesses don't want um, information. They don't want data. They can't really monetize it. You have to sell them customers for results. Um, you know, Google AdWords sells um, clicks that are potential customers. And if you read the even massive company like Google, they're saying they're selling you customers. So you know, a lot of times people make these analytics tools. Like I was making a Weibo tool to help you read into Chinese social media and tell you what Chinese people wanted. And then people didn't really care. Even if I gave away for free, they wouldn't even log in. So I was like giving people free login access. I would make their reports like here. They wouldn't log in. They didn't care. They just wanted customers. They just wanted. So I was like, you know, so we, we did, Chris, Chris did a great job. And we made, this is uh, something we made during the accelerator. So um, it basically is a search engine tool for customers inside of Sina Wayball. And it was a really difficult, um, that's why I was going to Beijing often to, to build my Guan Xi with my, uh, my uh, Sina Weibo of people I could find that does business development to get access to the API. Um, I don't want to get too technical on this, but to get access to searching inside of the Weibo tool. And uh, you know, I think that was another real lesson is don't build a tool on top of uh, another person's product. And I don't want to just talk about China either, but I think it was even more difficult to get access to Chinese data. But I, even, in Wave, even in Twitter, a lot of companies that were building on top of Twitter were, are failing because they were limiting your access to your API. So, you know, another, uh, this, this was happening in like, end of 2012 or something. Like we got out of the accelerator. And I, was, I should have listened to investors because I was like pitching uh, at different places and they were always nervous about the API access of Sina Weibo. And I could have, this is when I knew Weibo was gonna fail, is when they were saying that they were trying to sell me their data. So they're trying to sell 10,000 RMB a month to get full access to their, uh, to their search of their users. So I was like, do I pay 10,000 RMB, which is like 1,500 US uh, dollars, to uh, get access to, I can search, so people wanna sell real estate to Chinese people, I can search real estate by profile or by, by what they're saying and then pull it into our tool and then like make a, like a targeted list of potential customers for you to sell to. So, you know, um, Weibo agent became social agent and I think around Christmas day, I think in 2012, I was flying back from Beijing. I remember doing a redirect, socialagent.me. Um, so basically, you know, I think this is a lesson is don't build on somebody else's 
platform. I, but I, I know there's other feedback that says you leverage other people's user data instead of building your own user base. Uh, I know that's another feedback, but at least be cautious of uh, going all in on one platform. So we went to like human, the human social agent. Because then I started realizing uh, I pitched at 36KR, which is kind of like a tech crunch in China. Uh, Open Day in Shenzhen, like 2013, maybe August. And I remember there was investors and the panel, and I said, I don't need them. I need you guys to sign up for my system and help foreign companies sell in China through social, through people. Not Sina Weibo, not investors, but that's why I love social media is you can really get direct access to the people you need. Um, so we started recruiting people to be like a two-sided platform to connect companies to local sales reps to help you find customers. And then I had, to, then it was even harder to make a two-sided system because you gotta get not just one side of users like businesses, you have to get the agents or the people on the other side to, to do the actual work. So I had to, we had to validate that user and then they always said, I don't have time to go on my computer. I don't wanna search on my computer. I want a mobile app. And then in China, I think it is true, like mobile, mobile penetration is way bigger than desktops. A lot of people just skipped using a computer at all and just do everything on mobile. So I had my wife, brother make a first version of an uh, Android app. <laughs> this is our first version, uh, I think August 2012. And at the same time, I was, trying to I was trying to fundraise. And I'll talk about that later. I declined two offers for our company. Uh, so I just didn't, we just didn't think it was right. But, because uh, they were like, oh, build, build more, get more traction. So I'm like, I'm like starving, living on couches, like flying between Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, like, uh, getting anybody I can get to do anything I can possibly get to, but we made it, we launched it, and everybody, like, the investors are always like, amazing, how did you do that? Like, no money, like, I was always, uh, we we're always making things happen. So this is like a tool for the agents on a mobile phone to be able to, like, view jobs or opportunities for people to see what uh, Western companies, are like, I need somebody to help me sell real estate in, the, in China, or I need somebody to help me Usually it's real estate or education, like find rich parents, find rich Chinese people that want to buy real estate in the US, or rich people that send their kids to school in the US or, or other parts. Uh, so then we started doing these networking events, which I like to do anyway. So I started like recruiting, um, you know, like more and more people. We go to KTV, hiking, bowling, and then it led to like a, a launch day in, uh, in Shenzhen in the beach, uh, but the bus broke down. Uh, halfway through, so this uh, we had two buses. It was like amazing, like amount of people, like 80 or 90 people, uh, according to like a beach about an hour and a half away. But we did make it to the beach. Uh, we started doing slip and slides, and that was painful. I don't know if you can see what I just, there was no nobody else wanted to really do it, and I was like, so I was encouraging people, come on, like slip and slide. We got to slip and slide, and I was like, ski, like ripping my skin apart. And then we got one guy to do it, and he uh, had a concussion. He had never slipped and slide before in his life, and he was drinking alcohol for like two or three hours. And he was also like, these Laowai, these foreigners are like, all oh, the girls like this white, stupid guy, like slip and sliding, I'm gonna feed him. I think that's what he was thinking. I was like, and he's like, at the back of the beach. I'm like, I was encouraging him to go. And then he's like, I'm like, okay, slide. And he was like running on the slip, on the mat. And then he's like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> and he like slipped and went and cracked his head on the ground and it rumbled the sound and the rumble the ground and his head was knocked out and he slipped and then slipped to the bottom of the uh, of the of the slip side and he was knocked out and then it was like the busiest day of the year in August and I'm like oh man like seriously like, that's my assistant Amy and that's like doctors are coming and they're wearing like slippers and. And uh, it took like so long for, the, for them to come and he had to go to the hospital overnight. And I'm like, hey man, I'm, am I getting sued? I, I didn't get sued, but uh, I didn't know who the guy was. Supposedly he owned a, a factory. He was like a friend of a friend. I didn't even know, he, he didn't even pay me for, I had charged like 200 quiet to go. And he didn't even pay me anyway. He just came with a friend like in another car. But uh, we made it and we had some pictures. So we did a, this was like launch uh, about a year ago. A little bit over a year ago, hey, Jeff's, Jeff came and Mark, some guys here, and uh, they don't all work. These guys don't work with me. They're just 
supporters, but we did a good group picture. And then we became like a two-sided system to connect companies to uh, sales agents. And it's just like hustling and, and uh, grabbing agents, and grabbing companies. And then, um, so the, you know, the, the team like we've talked about this morning is everything, especially in an early stage startup. And you know, me, I guess, is the, is the CEO. You gotta like promise everybody everything. And uh, you know, um, this is a picture at uh, Startup Asia in Singapore, where we pitched in uh, April 2013. PC, I think, very close to picture. But um, and I think that's like the hardest thing is you have to promise everything to everyone and, and uh, you know, hope that the, the you know, everything's gonna be okay and uh, your know, family. Actually, it's more, I think it's easier for Westerners. Like, I really do believe it's easier for, for uh, Westerners because uh, they're a little more supportive. And already I kind of broke in the ice, like quitting my job at Deutsche Bank like a long time ago and already moving to Asia, so they didn't even know what I was doing anyway, so my family doesn't know. Friends are all pretty much supportive. You know, you just gotta keep on pushing, and keep on pushing. Um, and now, uh, so it's like very, very stressful. So we had never, we only raised the money from China Accelerator, but we have been somehow going for, uh, you know, a couple of years. And so now I wanna talk, it's a lot of text, but I wanna just kinda say some, some uh, common responses I would get normally talking to investors. Um, you know, I'd be interested to be a follow-on investor. I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs have heard that. You know, show me a term sheet. I'm interested, I like your idea. I don't, you know, either I'm too busy to be, uh, either I'm too busy to be uh, involved as a lead investor, or uh, I don't know how to make a term sheet. I'm always a follow investor, or um, I don't know your market enough. I don't know Chinese market enough. I might be interested to be a small investor. Uh, do you accept RMB? So this is like something I don't know. Like Chinese investors would want to give me RMB. I have a Hong Kong Limited. I'm living in China. I'm a foreigner. Uh, and you have to say yes. So you guys just say yes, and then somehow figure out how to make that work. Uh, you know, like sometimes they want to change your team. So I know we talked about that earlier. So I had that. I had that. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, you know, keep me always keep me posted on progress. I build up a 150 person email list of investors. Well, not just investors, but people say, keep you posted? So I'll say, okay, what's your email? I'll add you to my MailChimp campaign and I'll email you every two weeks what happens. So that was what I did when they said, keep you posted, which I recommend to do. Uh, or let's meet again in a couple of months. Months. Seriously, like I would have coffee meetings like constantly with like venture capitalists. And I wonder, and they said, well, we don't invest in early stage. I guess they just want to keep their relationship with you or I don't really know what the purpose was, but I would have coffee meetings with a lot of guys and then they would tell me like, oh, we only do like series A or B. So I'm like, why am I, why are you asking me to have coffee or why are we having coffee? Um, or get more traction. So that's like, I think, where you get to be like a, a zombie or something. But here's like another pitch event in Shenzhen. And uh, so I think this slide is good where I talk. I had two different investment offers from uh, investors in China. And uh, I know this is being recorded, so I can't say names because I don't want to. I don't want to mm, see this on Weibo or WeChat later. <clears throat> but um, so one was three hundred thousand uh, dollars U.S. And uh, he's pretty. I like. I respect the guy. He offered me second meeting, three hundred thousand. Um, but I had to dissolve my Hong Kong limited company, open a local company in his name. Uh, Sack Chris, um, I had to, I had 15,000 RMB I thought I wanted for salary, which is uh, $2,000. So I thought 15,000 is acceptable. And this is, a, remember this is like my assistant in a room, they're analysts, there's like a bunch of people in a boardroom. So he's like, he's like standing up like this at the projector with my like budget like, and he's like, this is why I don't invest in foreigners. He speaks English, okay. He's like, they're so expensive. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, is that like, I never know how much the salary acceptable for an investor. Uh, I'm like, well, what do you, what's normal? He's like, I never pay my founders more than 5,000 RP a month. He's like, I do not want my money to go towards your salary. I want you to keep, uh, I want you. I want you to be comfortable. And then he's like this. 
Oh, but yeah, I know foreigners need more money, so I'll give you 10,000 RMB. <laughs> <laughs> like this, and I think my assistant got five thousand RB. I had her on salary already. She already got five thousand, right? So then she's in there. It's like really, really like degrading, horrible like moment, like almost like a bungee jumping in a different kind of way. And I'm like, uh, and you know, it's like this racist. It's like this racism. And then I said, you're gonna pay me five thousand more because I'm white, and pay me five thousand. Don't pay me ten thousand because I'm white. What I said, and he, I think he liked that. He's like, this guy is cool, man. He's like, he's like, all right. He's like, you're, you're like, cool, man. And then he's like, okay, okay, let's just do this. And he goes on to a paper, and he's like, all right, three hundred thousand, thirty percent. And then he's like, uh, okay, and then he like wants me to shake on it. And then I'm like, uh, wait, I said like five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, it's at twenty percent. <laughs> And then, uh, and then I think we bargained a little bit more, like on this piece of paper, and uh, it got to be like I could get more, but it had to be like paying installments, like on miles, KPI milestones, and and then um, you know I was like already saying I'm like I'm gonna know because he's like oh, I have to open the company, it has to be my company, and you have a contract, I have a contract with you. And you own your shares. If you're a foreigner, you own the shares through me, and I have a contract to you. And then I'm like, so I, and then I have to get a tech 10 cent co-founder, technical co-founder. And he says he could help me find the 10 cent guy. And I'm like, so wait, I gotta like, I gotta like, live off of uh, 5,000 RB a month. Give a majority of my, like a lot of my company. You know, kick out my tech co-founder. Uh, uh, you know, like, give up my Hong Kong company. Uh, like, like uh, I can't even remember, it was just like, nigga, 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 nigga. And he's like, wanting me to sign, like, or agree right now. And I think he, like, accepted, he, like, thought I was agreeing, and he, like, left the room. Or maybe that's the strategy, but I was like, okay. And then uh, we went down to eat, and it was, like, a few of us, and it was, like, around, like, 2012, end of 2012. And, and, uh, and I, remember, I remember I was just talking to different advisors, and then they're like, it's funny, it's really funny with cultural differences. So I would talk to uh, Western investors, or Western advisors, like, are you crazy? No, that's like the worst deal I've ever heard in my life. And then I would tell, I'd talk to a Chinese person and then they would say, who's the name? And I was like, and I didn't finish saying this name, like, Ting. it's like all about the person, the Guan Chi, like, but if I like Google his name in English, he's like one. He was like arrested, arrested for uh, for uh, fraud between a Tencent China Mobile deal. It's like one of his top ten results in Google as he was in fraud for China Mobile uh, deal. So I was like, uh, so then I remember I was trying to start week, start a weekend, and I was telling people, and they're like, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. And I was thinking, like, I guess it'd be cool if I took it because that could be a cool blog post. I've been like the first foreigner that he invested in. And, Thought it'd be really cool, but I'm like, it's good. Like, probably be up here today in you know, a different type of story. So I didn't take it, and they thought it was crazy. And then I guess he probably went down with the best corners again. But um, and then there was a second one, but it wasn't really that big of money. It was just a, a, a few hundred thousand RV for a pretty high equity, and he called, also counted like office space and Guanxi network. I don't know how you put a value on your guanxi, but he kind of had a value of his guanxi and, and his value in his investment side. So uh, he thought it was crazy to say no too. So I'm out of time, but you know. Anyway, maybe this is a good one to read. Um, it's a TechCrunch article by Ben Horowitz, the the struggle, and then recently just got acquired by uh, Gigabud or Unchained Apps. So you know, it's good that I got to pay back some of my friends. <laughs> That lend me money, and uh, you know I'm not I'm not rich. We're not rich, but uh, we got to make even with our uh, our people, and uh, that's that's it. Talking about failures, uh, you got about two and a half minutes to go, uh, Mike. So if there's any questions, then. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for the speech. 
Oh, just wondering, why did it be good money on the Wall Street? Well, why did you leave the job at Wall Street, where oh. there's a lot of good money, obviously? So. Yeah, I mean, I filed $96,000 uh, U.S. on my tax return in 2006, um, but uh, it was it was really I was taking antidepressants. I was really like depressed, man. And then uh, I was seeing psychiatrists, and they would say like, "Oh, don't feel bad. Everybody here takes to antidepressants. It's just, just put it in the New York City water system. Everybody here, I I bring prescribing all your colleagues. I would drink like five coffees by noon or something like this." I switched to like Dr. Pe Diet Dr. Pepper just because it tastes better by lunch. And then like uh, we get off work like 7 or 8 p.m. And then we go to beer or alcohol until like 1 o'clock in the morning. And then we get up like 6 a.m. to get in by 7. And I was like, and uh, plus I was doing my eBay business at the same time. And I was always, I had something called the FU fund on my uh, E-Trade account. So I put as much money in the FU fund as I just nicknamed it on my E-Trade. The FU fund um, to save about 80 grand. I thought I was going to do MBA, but uh, I went to CAT. It's a, it's a short, long and a short story. But I went to those prep tests to get your, your, your Kaplan, uh, Kaplan for GMAT. And then everybody in the, was like off Broad Street, right off Wall Street. And then the first day was like, what's your name? Where do you work? Where do you want to do your MBA? Hi, I'm Jack. I work at Lehman Brothers. I want to get an MBA to get a raise. Hi, I'm Gene. I work at Goldman Sachs. I want to get an MBA so I can get a management position. Like that, everybody was like that. And then it could be like, hi, I'm Mike, I work at Deutsche Bank, I want to get a, I want to get a MBA so I can start my own business and be an entrepreneur. And they're like, who are you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess I'm in the wrong room. Thank you. 